I started reading John Kramer's book and it mentions the photoelectric effect. It says he reasoned that since light had a particle like behavior, as shown by Einstein's analysis of the photoelectric effect, it was plausible that matter particles like electrons might show an analogous wave like behavior. So interesting. What if it's not that everything is particles? What if it's that everything is waves? So they tested electrons. What do you guys think happens when they tested electrons to see if they act like waves? Turns out they do. Turns out they do act like waves. The wavelength of the photon be can be calculated by dividing by uh, Planck's constant by its momentum. If electrons show wave-like behavior, uh, Bruji uh, reasoned, they might have wavelengths given by the same relation. He applied his wavelength reason to Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom, and he found that precisely integer number of electron wavelengths, as calculated by his formula, fitted into the circumference of each stable orbit of Bohr's model as standing waves. In other words, Bohr's assumption that each orbit had an integer number of uh, Planck's constant units of angular momentum was completely equivalent to assuming that matter is just energy trapped in a standing wave in a resonance. Wow. Why do we keep talking about standing waves? Because everything is waves. And when you manipulate the wavelength, you can make your wave fit between the walls of this room of your object. And that's was the basis of quantum mechanics. So we found that the electron acts like a wave. And it's basically acting like a little wave stuck in a little box back and forth. That's why we can't measure its location. A wave of what exactly? A wave of what? Thank you, Elvis. Well, what do you guys think? What is it a wave of? What is the electron, I guess, is the big question. What is the electron? Well, what would Dr. Yu from NASA say the electron is? It's a little magnet. Wow. Okay, it's a little magnet, a little dipole. Well, now we're seeing that light is a wave. Electrons are a wave. Maybe just everything is a wave. And maybe it's just scale invariant. Very small things are trapped energy in a resonance. Maybe we are also trapped energy in a resonance, just built up bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Just more and more and more complex. So I was pretty excited about this. I mean, he's saying the stuff that I is just really interesting to me. So he says, each atomic electron is a stable particle in a box standing wave with the box consisting of the electron's path bent into a closed circle or ellipse by the electric field of the nucleus. So what's happening? The electron is actually a wave that is being pulled around the nucleus by the electric field of the nucleus itself. Later experiments showed that, yes, you can create interference patterns with electrons, which shows they must be a wave. Boom. When you think of a pulse, there's various factors that go into that pulse. Now, if I want to make a wave, I can interact and create that wave in, much, in a lot of different ways. Now, I like to just think of it in terms of like pressing a button. Let's say if I press the button, then it goes up over here. If I unpress the button, it goes back down. So I press this button, thing goes up. Let go of the button, goes back down, okay? So I can press the button rapidly, right? Or I can press the button slowly, and it'll be like, right? Now you guys are with me. But I can also hold down the button. Beep, beep, beep. So I actually have control over a few different ways I can manipulate the button, right? I can press it very shortly, small, short pulses, or I can do long pulses as well. Beep. 
So that is how I think these Fournier transformations come into play. And there's this really cool image here on this website that I found that kind of shows what I was trying to describe, probably better than I was explaining it. So you can kind of see with the, the box that goes up and over, like how you might beep pulsing it, right? And this is going to be really important because I think this is going to be the secret to how they're entangling the plane. How are they actually connecting the plane in the video to the other location? That's probably the big national security secret. Parametric studies for dense plasma focus for fusion space propulsion. And the author is this guy, C.L. Leakius. Leakius. But of course, Frank Mead is on the paper, right? He's on all of them. I would really, really love to get a list of all the Frank Mead papers because once I started realizing that this dense plasma focus is basically the baseline of this technology, I found a bunch of papers about it. Like it, clearly they were working on this through the 90s and the 2000s and figuring out how to make it even better and better and better. A coaxial electrode system known as the dense plasma focus is investigated as a possible space propulsion concept. A large potential, potential difference between the electrodes ionizes the gaseous fusion fuel and forms an annular plasma sheath. This plasma sheath then propagates down the length of the anode and training additional fuel along the way. The rundown phase is analyzed by solving the momentum equation using this snowplow model. At the end of the anode, magnetohydrodynamic instabilities caused the sheath to collapse into a hot, highly dense plasma where fusion events occur. Fusion reaction products as well as unreacted fuel can then be used as to produce thrust. It is also possible to use the reaction process to heat hydrogen propellant in order to produce more thrust. An open-ended coolant cycle might be used in order to avoid the necessity for large radiators. In this way, the heated coolant can be used to drive a turbo generator to produce electricity before it is exhausted as propellant. Like they were looking at this for how to make those plasma orbs. My guess is if we were to look inside the orbs, we would see an advanced version of something like this. They probably have been able to turn this into something that's very small. And what we would be looking at would be like a toolbox. So probably what happened was Frank Mead uh, got together all these guys, Eric Davis, Friedwart Winterberg, uh, people like John Kramer, Hal Pudoff, you know, all these guys got together and they started figuring all this stuff out because they were geniuses. And where do they build it? Where are they building this? They're not building that at the Air Force. They're building that at Lockheed Martin's secret labs that's where they're building that kind of thing right they're building that and testing that at wright patterson air force base and lockheed martin's the one that's building it but lockheed martin's having literally paying those engineers to build components of it and some of them probably to put it together right that's where that kind of stuff is happening yeah skunk works things like that right that's what's happening and the ufo thing is the perfect cover the UFO thing is the perfect cover because what are we reading? There's no exotic physics in these papers, but the concepts they're explaining are gravity waves. <laughs> when he's explaining this pulse laser concept, that's exactly what Charles, uh, oh, what was his name? Chance, Chance. Uh, you know, that's what he was saying is that it's this like energy difference that causes the gravity waves. You create this pulse and you have it go away and you put this pulse in place and then that's what causes the gravity waves. Why are we building stupid fusion reactors that are attached to the ground? Why aren't we using the movements of an object to cause fusion to happen? That's so much smarter. And the perfect propulsion, the, this perfect momentum where it's just sailing along just the lasers just shooting forward, boom, 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 and just sailing along. That's also genius. Ions come to thermal equilibrium inside the pinch, allowing the use of Maxwellian reaction rate parameters. So basically they're saying that they can use the Maxwell, um, 
Bose, the uh, Maxwell Bozeman distribution to figure out when fusion is going to happen. So they're like, we can basically just using the Z pinch. We can basically just figure make standard fusion occur just because of we're doing this. This is again, 1991. Materials will be developed that can withstand temperatures must ha much higher than currently possible. This would be necessary in the turbine and in the walls of the mixing chambers. I think they got around this problem because they created a thermoelectric generator that keeps the temperature stable. So one of the problems with fusions, you're going to have this excess heat that you have to worry about, right? You don't want your things to get too hot. Ideally, you want your thing to be as cold as possible for quantum effects. So what do you do? You create a thermoelectric converter, turns heat into electricity. That's exactly what you want. I'll take that heat. We turn it into electricity, right? That's what you want. That's how I think they fix some of the instability problems. In fact, I have another paper we're going to look at here just briefly that talks about correcting the instabilities. Confinement times can be increased about 100 times to allow for good fusion burn. Since reaction rates are determined by plasma temperature, longer confinement times allow for more fuel to be burned. So they basically broke through the barrier on confinement time. One of the main factors for fusion is confinement time. How long can you keep the thing confined before it eats through the metal, eats through the, the, the actual like containment? And clearly they got to a point where the confinement time is long enough now where they can teleport stuff. So, you know, that was 10 years ago. Presumably they have perfect confinement, like perfect confinement. And once you have perfect confinement, you can create a fusion reaction at will. And so the problem, the reason why they're so terrified, the reason why this is a national security risk is it's easy to produce this. Once you get electromagne electromagnetic effects that are powerful enough, it becomes easy to cause these insane teleportation type effects to occur. Um, and I think they're afraid that you look forward and you say, well, everybody's going to have access to these. Everybody's going to have their own personal orbs in the near future. And how does the world react to that? How does how do we survive that? 